Welcome to the Kotke Ride Home for Friday, April 9th, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. The story of the woman whose decades of research helped make the mRNA COVID vaccines possible. Plus, electric cars don't make much noise, which means we have the opportunity now to design what the future will sound like. And the co-founder of Elon Musk's Neuralink casually mused over the weekend that they could technically build Jurassic Park if they wanted to. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. The messenger RNA, or mRNA technology, used in two of the leading COVID-19 vaccines, Pfizer-BioNTech and Moderna, is not exactly new, even though these are the first vaccines to be approved for use. As I've mentioned before on this show, the concept goes back decades. But it was a tough nut to crack, and the funding for it was rarely there, since it was such an unorthodox kind of idea. One of the main scientists who believed in its potential and worked tirelessly on it for years is Dr. Catalan Carrico. Carrico has spent her entire career focusing on mRNA, believing it could be utilized to instruct cells to make their own medicines. She wasn't alone in this hypothesis, but she did stand out for her commitment to it, with peers, including Dr. Fauci, remarking on her single-minded passion. Born and raised in a small Hungarian town, Dr. Kariko also earned her PhD in her home country, but immigrated to the U.S. to work at Temple University in Philadelphia after the research program she was a part of as a postdoctoral fellow ran out of money. And here's a little interesting aside that illustrates Kariko's grit. Because the Hungarian government had a maximum of $100 that they could take with them out of the country, she and her husband, Bella Francia, sewed the equivalent of just over $1,200 into their two-year-old daughter Susan's teddy bear. And another little fact that I feel like a lot of outlets are burying the lead on, their daughter Susan is now a two-time Olympic gold medalist in rowing. Considering how many people are hinting that Kariko may soon be winning a Nobel Prize, this is certainly a well-decorated family, and a super accomplished one no matter what. But anyways, so Kariko eventually ended up at the University of Pennsylvania, and continued on a nearly careers-long trend of being super committed to her work, and rarely rewarded for it. She frequently lost out on grants that didn't want to take a risk on her mRNA work, hopped from lab to lab to be supported by senior scientists, and the New York Times notes never made more than $60,000 a year. In 1995, she even got demoted from her path to full professorship because there was just no money coming in for her research. At the time, she had also just been through a cancer scare, and her husband was stuck back in Hungary with a visa issue. Karika told Stat last fall, quote, Usually, at that point, people just say goodbye and leave because it's so horrible. I thought of going somewhere else or doing something else. I also thought, maybe I'm not good enough, not smart enough. I tried to imagine everything is here and I just have to do better experiments, end quote. And so she stuck it out. After some early success figuring out how to use mRNA to make any type of protein, Karika once again hit on a series of being punted from lab to lab as her senior colleagues left programs for more lucrative opportunities. Finally, she ended up partnering with Dr. Drew Weissman, and the two worked out some kinks in the mRNA experiments that Kariko had recently been teasing out. They hit on a crucial discovery about the immune response in their mRNA versus mRNA, as well as transfer RNA, or tRNA, in humans. Quoting the New York Times, A molecule called sidoridine in tRNA allowed it to evade the immune response. As it turned out, naturally occurring human mRNA also contains the molecule. Added to the mRNA made by Dr. Carrico and Dr. Wiseman, the molecule did the same, and also made the mRNA much more powerful, directing the synthesis of 10 times as much protein in each cell. The idea that adding pseudoridine to mRNA protected it from the body's immune system was a basic scientific discovery with a wide range of thrilling applications. It meant that mRNA could be used to alter the functions of cells without prompting an immune system attack. End quote. But, once again, funders and even scientific journals rejected them. Wiseman says that grant reviewers didn't think mRNA would be a good therapeutic, so there was no point in bothering with their research. 
And to be clear, many fellow scientists recognized the potential of what they were doing, but many fellow scientists are also all too familiar with being rejected by the people who control the purse strings. Undeterred, Kariko and Wiseman kept working, soon proving that they could induce a monkey with mRNA for a particular protein to successfully cause the expected effect, leading them to believe they'd be able to use that same method to instruct human bodies to produce any protein drug, like insulin or other hormones, and be used to make vaccines in an entirely new way. Quoting again, Instead of injecting a piece of virus into the body, doctors could inject mRNA that would instruct cells to briefly make that part of the virus, end quote. But once again, no one with the dollars cared. They spoke with pharmaceutical companies and venture capitalists, and no one took a chance on them. Until two now very well-known companies, Moderna and BioNTech, who later partnered with Pfizer. Working with those companies, they had already begun clinical trials on an mRNA flu vaccine and were taking steps toward building vaccines against Zika and others when the coronavirus hit. Now, in addition to Carrico and Wiseman's work on mRNA, there were also two other crucial elements that helped us get vaccines as soon as we did. First was established research on other coronaviruses, which meant scientists were already familiar with the spike protein that allows the virus to penetrate cells. And second was the incredibly fast work of Chinese scientists sequencing the virus and publishing that online in January of last year. From there, Moderna was able to design their COVID-19 mRNA vaccine in just two days, and BioNTech in just a few hours. There was still a lot more work that needed to go into the vaccine development and testing, and fast. But unlike for most of Carico's career thus far, this time, every single funder was ready to pour their money and resources into the work. Quoting again from the Times, on November 8th, the first results of the Pfizer-BioNTech study came in, showing that the mRNA vaccine offered powerful immunity to the new virus. Dr. Carrico turned to her husband. Oh, it works, she said. I thought so. To celebrate, she ate an entire box of Goober's chocolate-covered peanuts by herself. End quote. I love that. And when her and Dr. Wiseman got their vaccines in mid-December, it was at a press event where people broke out into applause in gratitude for the scientists who helped make the vaccine possible. For Dr. Carrico's part, this is a story about someone who was rejected over and over again, who pushed through an institution that didn't value her, who went through huge upheavals in her own life, and miraculously not just survived, not even just thrived, but is now partially responsible for saving countless lives and helping to revolutionize how all vaccines will work going forward. This isn't just about COVID-19, it's about HIV, malaria, and so many diseases with ineffective or no vaccines at all. And the method could go beyond vaccines, too. Dr. Carrico did not do this alone, but much of it couldn't have been done without her. And Dr. David Langer, a neurosurgeon who once worked with Dr. Carrico, pointed out to the New York Times, quote, There are probably many people like her who failed, end quote. I would amend that slightly to say that there are probably so many people whom we have failed, there were so many times when Dr. Carrico was fighting against so much, and not a single person would have blamed her for quitting. How many more brilliant discoveries might be made if we found better ways to encourage and support more people in their work? It's a big challenge, so for now, I will simply be endlessly grateful to Dr. Carrico and to Dr. Wiseman, and hope that the Nobel Committee is paying attention. I mean, Dr. carrico has got to catch up to her daughter's two gold medals. The sound and volume of cars is definitely a bit of a controversial point. As someone who lives in the city, I'm often annoyed by overly loud cars, especially the ones that modify them to make them so loud that they set off all the car alarms on the block when they speed past my apartment, usually while I'm recording this podcast. I do get that the sound of the engine is a big deal for some car enthusiasts, though. I mean, I know when someone mentioned to my dad that his motorcycle was a bit quiet, I found him drilling holes in the exhaust the next day. And I was taught when learning to drive manual that you should be able to tell when to shift gears based on the sound and feeling of the engine, not just by looking at the tachometer. And then there's, of course, the safety element. Being able to hear an oncoming vehicle can be life-saving for drivers and pedestrians alike. And that is one of the bigger critiques of the mostly silent electric vehicles. Due to a lack of moving parts, they tend to be ultra-quiet. 
But both out of a sense of preference and due to some regulated safety requirements, most models are designed with a suite of sounds that can be adjusted in the car's settings. If you're Ford, this means digitally produced engine noises based on recordings from race cars, electric guitars, and power lines. And if you're Tesla, it means a selection of over half a dozen different fart sounds. And since, apparently, we can make electric vehicles sound like anything, Alejandro de la Garza, writing in Time, says this presents an enormous opportunity for us to design the soundscape of the future. While de la Garza paints it in that macro and inspiring way, most of the sound designers he talked to were focused on branding. Figuring out a brand's sound logo is a fascinating process. I shared in August how Netflix produced and settled on their famous ta sound logo. And if you want to peek at what all goes into that kind of thing, link is in the show notes to that episode. And the car companies aren't totally wrong to be focused on their own bottom line here. We need EVs to sell. As De La Garza points out, 90% of U.S. roads have to be electric by 2050 to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. And while more and more companies are making them and the market is definitely growing rapidly, at the moment, EVs only make up about 2% of cars sold nationwide. So making sure the cars are appealing to people in every way, including how they sound, is important. The prospect, however, is a bit intimidating. Jonathan Pierce, a senior manager of experiential R&D at Harman, an automotive technology company, said, quote, It's kind of like when the 1993 film Jurassic Park was made and they had to come up with the sound of a dinosaur. None of us has ever heard a dinosaur. End quote. And while De La Garza describes it as not just designing the Guggenheim, but the entire Manhattan skyline, I would say it's a little bit more like each car company is designing the Guggenheim and the Chrysler building and all combining to make one skyline that could work in harmony or could be completely and utterly chaotic. This is the point made by Trevor Cox, a professor of acoustic engineering at the University of Salford in the UK and author of The Sound Book, The Science of the Sonic Wonders of the World, who told Time, quote, The submotive sound of every city is pretty much its cars. As soon as you change the sound of cars, you're going to change how the city sounds. He argues that excessive customization and diversity of vehicle sound could turn urban soundscapes into jarring, chaotic disasters. We have a sense of what hell would be like because we lived through it when people first got mobile phones, he says. Everyone decided to have a ringtone that was individual, and you had this horrible cacophony. End quote. Now, De La Garza counters with how, nowadays, most people leave phones on vibrate, and a lot of people will probably eventually do the same with EVs, only using sounds for essential safety reasons. But we will probably have that annoying ringtone phase. And what might that sound like? Car companies tend to fall into two camps right now. Those like Audi, Ford, and Jaguar who are trying to recreate the sounds of our familiar gasoline cars, the revving, the grit, the power. And others like Nissan and BMW are trying to innovate and create sounds that are more musical and futuristic. BMW in particular has been working with Hans Zimmer to design the sounds for their i4 electric sedan. Quote, at low speeds, the i4 sounds like an electrified orchestra warming up for a performance, but as it accelerates, the tone becomes deeper and lower. Then comes a high-pitched skittering effect, as if some kind of reality-bending reaction were taking place under the hood. End quote. There's a lot of interesting and creative work out there right now, and no one knows exactly where it will land, since a lot of what sounds cool in a studio sounds completely different on the road. And since most EV owners still tend to be a particular type of person, what does an ordinary driver want? What will we end up deciding we want to hear en masse when EVs are the majority of the vehicles on the roads? De La Garza points out that depending on how radically EVs change the soundscape, it could also completely upend some parts of urban design, with living directly next to a busy road not being as unappealing as it currently is to some. The sounds of engines is such an ordinary part of our soundscape that it's kind of tough to imagine what else background noise on the road and in cities might sound like or not in the future. Will it be largely the same kind of engine revs but in a weirdly uniform tone? Or will it be spacecraft adjacent harmonies designed by Hans Zimmer himself? Or a total chaos of app store style customization? I think I personally pick the futuristic musical option, 
I mean, how wild would it be if BMW's design turns out triumphant and Hans Zimmer didn't just compose some of the greatest movie scores of the century, but literally designed the background noise of our cities for generations to come? Wild. And by way of a brief epilogue here, Jason shared a good link today on Kotki.org from The Conversation, emphasizing that if we're really trying to hit net zero emissions in cities, what we actually need to be focusing on more is cycling, which generates 10 times less carbon than an electric vehicle. EVs aren't carbon neutral, after all. The electricity they need to run, the manufacturing of them, and the mining of raw materials all produces emissions. They're way better than fuel cars, of course, but they've got nothing on the environmentally friendly bicycle. So we probably should have seen this coming. Max Hodak, the co-founder of Elon Musk's Neuralink company, which is working on implantable brain-machine interfaces, tweeted on Easter Sunday of all days, quote, we could probably build Jurassic Park if we wanted to. Wouldn't be genetically authentic dinosaurs, but shrug emoji. Maybe 15 years of breeding and engineering to get super exotic novel species. End quote. He followed that up with this tweet a few minutes later, quote, Biodiversity, anti-fragility, is definitely valuable. Conservation is important and makes sense. But why do we stop there? Why don't we more intentionally try to generate novel diversity? End quote. How about no? How many times must we memify Dr. Ian Malcolm's immortal words, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. I mean, I swear, billionaires and certain scientists just watch Jurassic Park and think, yeah, but I could do it right. I mean, if the risk of killing so many people doesn't deter them, at the very least, they should be required to rewatch the scene from the original film of Jurassic Park designer and benefactor John Hammond sadly eating all the ice cream from the park's restaurant before it melts as Dr. Ellie Sattler pushes him to reckon with his own hubris. That one always hits me real hard. But anyways, that is it for this week. Hopefully there are no dinosaurs in our future. And as always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again on Monday.